Well, good morning, friends. How wonderful to see you. If we haven't met yet, my name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here at MBM. And I want to start today by telling you a story about a friend of mine called Marty. Now, listen, Marty was a guy, I haven't seen him for a while, but when I knew him, he was an epically enormous bodybuilder. Okay, he's one of those guys, he used to have like probably quadruple XL shorts, and they still burst at the size like Hulk. His legs, when he ran, looked like two wombats fighting against each other. Like, boom, 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 boom. The guy was a beast, Uruguayan Adanis, just... Now, at the time, I was working out a bit. I was lifting weights and going to the gym with him. And I said to him, Marty, mate, how come my body is not transforming the same way that yours has? And after he picked himself up off the floor of the thought of me ever looking like him, he said, Jeno, mate, let me put it to you straight. You eat like a pig. You've got to cut out the fast food, the junk food, the sugary food, the lollies. Get rid of all of it. You see... It's not, your issue isn't the lifting weights, your issue is the diet. And you can't expect to transform your body without both working simultaneously. You can't have one without the other. Now, on my way home from hanging out with him, smashing down some popcorn chicken from the colonel, I was like, you know what, he might have a point here. Because this guy, he was obsessed with what he ate. He didn't even eat chicken skin. Surely that must be a capital offence. Chicken skin is evidence of God. That he's, I mean, chicken skin is delicious. He wouldn't even touch that. It candies, calories, the rest of it. He was proof positive. On one hand, if you want to grow lean muscle mass, you've got to work out, you've got to exercise, you've got to do that stuff. But if you want to have the full transformative effect, and more than that, actually the health benefit and the rest of it, you need the diet. On its own with just a diet, well, you never put on the muscle mass. On its own with just the exercise, well, you'll never have genuine transformation. You can't have one without the other. My friends, allow me to ask you a question this morning. What is it that you want from life? What is it that you want from life? You know, you might be surprised because you look across this auditorium and there's people from every sort of background, every type of country and suburb and job and the rest of it. But all of us, most of us I think anyway, actually really only want one thing in life. We want to live the good life. What's the good life? Well, we want to be happy. Yeah, of course we do. We want to be happy and content. But more than that, I'm yet to meet someone who doesn't say, I want to live a life of significance. I want to live a life that matters. I want to live a life that counts for something, that has purpose and its meaning. All of us want to live the good life. And so what we end up doing, deliberately or accidentally, is we end up climbing a stairway of achievement, trying to find the good life. We spend years, decades, working Sometimes just to survive, but often just to earn. We take that step. And then we think, okay, well, I've got to get married, or I need a girlfriend or a boyfriend. We take that step. Okay, I've got to have kids. I've got to get a house. I've got to get a car. I've got to do this and this and this. Climbing these steps all the time with this image of ourselves in the future where we're going to be happy, we're going to be content, we're going to be meaningful, we're going to be purposeful. And yet the truth is, it doesn't matter how high you climb, The good life is always beyond our fingertips, isn't it? We can never quite grasp it. Why do you think that is? Why is the good life so hard to grasp? God's word in the Bible speaks directly to this question. And what he says is life-changing. Check this out. God says the good life can only be found with him in it. And not to the periphery, not to the side, not a jacket you put on and take off when it's convenient. At the core, at the centre, that our years and years of sweat and toil and decades of work are meaningless unless God is in the middle of it. Because God, even if you know it or not, is actually what you need. He's actually what you truly want But check this out. Not only can you not have the good life without God, you can't have God without experiencing the good life. You can't have one without the other. 
So what we're going to do today is actually look at what the Bible says about living the good life. We're going to answer three questions together. Question one, where do we find the good life? What does the Bible say about that? Question two, what does it look like, the day-to-day practical living of living the good life? And question three, how will other people respond to our living it? So let's start together at the big question, the, the one that most of us have spent some time thinking about. Where do we find it? Where do we actually find the good point, good life? What's the starting point for living this life? And this might surprise you, but believe it or not, it's not found at the top of any stairway of achievement. It's found on the top of a cross 2,000 years ago. The Bible reading we had is from the book of 1 Peter. We're in the middle of a series on 1 Peter. And if you've got your Bibles there, have a look at verse 18. It'll be on the screen, though, just in case you don't. And let's have a look what Peter writes to us. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The first step in grasping the good life is understanding exactly what Jesus of Nazareth, that carpenter 2,000 years ago, what he did for you. He suffered. Now we've all, most of us, seen The Passion on the Cross, that film, remember with Mel Gibson, and we see Jesus suffering physically. We know that, but there's more taking place. He suffers emotionally and mentally, but also spiritually. What happened there? We'll have a look again at verse 18. The righteous for the unrighteous, the only perfect person who ever lived, dying in place of all the unperfect people, all the unrighteous people. But why? To bring you, you, me, to bring you to God. So we can know God, not just know about him, but know him. And this action, Christ dying on the cross, is the cornerstone of the good life. What, why does it matter? It matters because God is the creator. That means God didn't just create the stars and the moon and the, the gra- gravity and air and plants. and He created you. And so he knows what's best for you, whether you know it or not. He knows what life you were meant to live. He knows the most satisfying life that you can live. And he says, the starting point, the building block, is found in what Jesus has done on the cross. Why? Because through what Jesus has done on the cross, you can know him. And that's why in the next verses, verses uh, 19 to 22, what's described is the picture after Jesus has died, but it's not a picture of tragedy, but a picture of triumph. Check it out. Peter refers to Jesus being made alive at his death. Isn't that strange? When Jesus has died, he's made alive. That when he left the physical world and re-entered the spiritual world, it was not the sun set, but the sunrise. It was not the end, but the beginning. Verse 19 and 20 describe how Jesus proclaimed the victory over death to people who were disobedient years ago. And it doesn't end there. In verse 21, we read about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. Verse 22 talks about Jesus being ascended into heaven. Jesus is alive. He is triumphant. He is victorious. But before you think, well, this is a nice resume of Jesus. This is a nice picture of what Jesus has done 2,000 years ago. Okay, very nice. Understand this. This is deeply personal. It's about you and me. Have a look again at verse 20 to 22. It talks a lot about Noah and the flood. Why? Well, what happened with Noah? In the time of Noah, God punished wickedness. He punished sin by flooding the earth. And it seems brutal to us when we think about it, doesn't it? But actually, the Bible is really clear. This is what sin deserves. Sin deserves punishment. But for you and me, verse 21, have a look. This water symbolizes baptism, which now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience before God. You and I, no different in our wickedness than the people of Noah's time, do not have to face judgment, but can be saved. Let me ask you a question. How did Noah and his family, how did they survive? They clung to the wooden structure of the ark as the flood raged around them. How do you and I survive? Or we cling to a different wooden structure. 
The only way you and I survive is by clinging to the cross of Christ in the midst of the flood of sin and judgment that storms around us that we deserve. The cross is the only place where we can survive. And that's why he talks about baptism. He's not saying you must be baptized to be saved. That's not what he's saying. He says not the removal of dirt from the body. He says baptism is the physical expression of the spiritual reality of the saved person. The washing clean our sin and becoming anew. So that's the good life. It starts with understanding more than that. With making for your own what Jesus has done on the cross, there can be no other building block, no other cornerstone. God isn't looking for your behavior before belief. We put the cart before the horse all the time. We put it back to front. But God puts the heart before the course. I want your heart. Then I'll sort out the course. I'm a bit of a visual learner, though, so I thought, listen, let me try and explain what's happening here doing a demonstration. Now, for this demonstration, I need four volunteers. I've hit them up earlier. Would you put your hands together and welcome our four very good-looking volunteers to the front? Let's go. Please, more applause. I think they need more. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Please come here, come here. Just line up here. Now, I have not told them what's going to happen, so they're, is, they're nervous, okay? But it should be okay. Okay, Nate, brother, you're going to play a role. Everyone here is going to play a role. This is the role of your life. You're going to play... God the Father. Can you do it? No, you can't. But listen, you're going to give it a go. Just go to that green suitcase over there. Well done, Nate. Brother Paul, this is a terrible role. You're going to play Adolf Hitler. Okay, don't do any actions for it. Just that's who you're going to be. So go down there just to the other side. Now, I'm going to come back to you in a second. Alastair, fantastic. Privilege. You're going to play Jesus Christ. So where are you going to be? You're going to be all the way over there with Nate. Can you do that? Just ne- directly next to him, please. Yep, there we go. Okay, I want you to imagine, just stay there, sister. I want you to imagine this is a scale of goodness. Here, Adolf Hitler, one of the worst human beings who ever lived, murderer, criminal, ugh, awful. Here, perfection, God the Father, God the Son. Mel, you're playing yourself. And everyone here, and me. Where do you think, I'll just ask everyone, where do you think you will go on the scale of goodness? Well, we tend to think, Mel, just come up here, we tend to think we're around here, just in the centre, is that right? Kind of. But God says you're going to be judged when you die by not just by what you do, but by what you think and what you say. So the reality is, Mel, We're actually far more just around here. That's the truth of the matter. Now, the big question, of course, on everyone's lips is where's the cutoff line? Where's the line where we think God looks at us and goes, tick, you made it. Again, we generally tend to think it's somewhere here, just to the right of us. But we'll be okay. I hope I've done okay. But again, we've got to listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says that's not true. There is no good enough. The the level, the standard for entry to heaven is perfection. It's based on Jesus Christ. It's all the way up there. And I I don't, it doesn't matter how high your self-esteem is. I don't think many people would go, yeah, I'm as good as Jesus. If you do, please come and see me later. We'll talk about it. But that's the reality. This is the reality of life. This is where we stand. The only way to heaven is by being perfect. But we are far from perfect. So what happened on the cross? Let's look at verse 18 again. Christ suffered on the cross once for sins. Nate, could you turn around and face that wall? On the cross, God the Father turned his back on his son. An eternal relationship broken. Worse than that, God poured out all the anger and all the rage against our sin on Jesus, his son. So what happened? The righteous became the unrighteous. Alistair, could you come down with me? Look at verse 18 up again, please. You could say, come all the way down here, please, that on the cross, Jesus became the most sinful man who ever existed as 
Thousands and thousands and millions of sins of all these believers of all these generations were poured out on him. Why? The righteous for the unrighteous, Mel. To bring you all the way, I know it seems unbelievable, to, oh, to bring you to God. That's what happened on the cross. But it gets better than that. Look at the verse 21, verse 22. It doesn't end here. Jesus is not still dead. He is resurrected. Thanks, brother. Not only that, he's resurrected to physical form, but then he ascended into heaven. He sits today at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Jesus is alive and he reigns in heaven. And if Jesus is your Lord, then just like our dear sister Mel, God no longer views you by your sin. He views you with the perfection of Jesus Christ. Oh, Put your hands together. Thank our beautiful volunteers. Thank you very much. The good life is not found anywhere else. It's only through what Jesus has done on the cross. That's the building block. If you do not have that, it does not matter what you do. You will not have it. So that's how we get it. But what's next? What does it actually look like, if you remember our second question, to live the good life, to live with God as your king, with Christ as your saviour? Well, for this, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of the passage, to verse 8. If you've got your Bibles, have a look at verse 8. It's going to come up on the screen here. And remember this right now, though. Peter is writing this letter to Christians. This is to people who love Jesus, who've accepted what Jesus has done on the cross. This isn't like a guideline for life to earn God's love, but as a result of it. Look at verse 8, verse 9. You see, immediately that we're given a very practical, very specific set of guidelines to follow, proactive and reactive guidelines for how we should live our lives. Christians, you, if you're a Christian, you ought to be like-minded. That means united with each other, sympathetic and compassionate, not hard-hearted, but warm-hearted, to be humble, not just thinking of ourselves less, but thinking less of ourselves. A great summary of the way we're to live is right in the middle there. Love one another. Not theoretically. There's no such thing as theoretical love. Real love. Genuine, passionate love. That's proactive, how we're to act as Christians, you and I, as lovers of Jesus. But reactive, have a look. We're not to repay evil with evil, but we're to re react to evil and to insult with... Blessing. It's okay, let's think back again. We've got Christ as the cornerstone, the starting block of the good life. And here's the ABC, the one, two, three of what it looks like to live as a Christian. Why should we live this way? Because God tells us to live this way. And he's the creator. He's the boss. He's the king. But there's more than that. Again, look at verse 9. It's deeper. Live this way because... To this you were called, so you may inherit a blessing. To this you were called. What's that mean? That means as a Christian, you were chosen to live this way. You are commanded to live this way. Not a suggestion, you've been called to live this way. But then look at that second part. So that you may inherit a blessing. What's that mean? My two and a half year old Sonny, he's recently proved victorious over toilet training. It had nothing, thank you, but it had nothing to do with me. Okay, my wife was all about it. Oh, it was just horrendous, so I mean, dead set. Um, the way my wife, Sammy, made it all happen was by using a sticker reward system. Has anyone used this before? So if he would do his business successfully, well, not that he would do it successfully, it's where he would do it successfully, he would get a sticker. And he'd be like, woo, 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 like, I got the sticker. So much so that when he needed to go to the toilet, he wouldn't say, toilet, toilet. He'd go, sticker, sticker, sticker. <laughs> he did the right thing. He got a reward. Is this what God is giving us now? We do the right thing and we get the spiritual equivalent of a sticker. Well done. Do we get a material blessing from God? Are we going to be healthy or wealthy or wise? We're going to be smarter, have better luck, go straight to the horses, throw down a thousand. Is that what's happening? 
oh, brothers and sisters, we minimise God with our thoughts of blessings. Let's maximise our minds and see what God is promising to give us. Verse 10. You're going to inherit a blessing. Here's what it is. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil, their lips from deceitful speech. Live a life of love and you will love life. The good life, meaning, purpose, contentment, love, it's yours if you would obey God. If you would turn from evil and do good. We think, man, that's crazy. That's huge, but it gets bigger. Look at verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. Live a life of love and you will love life. Live a life of love and you will know God. And he will know you. Now remember again, this is called an inheritance. What does that mean? You can't earn an inheritance. It's yours by blood. When you become a Christian, you are adopted as a son or a daughter of God. This is your inheritance. This is as a result of putting Jesus as your king like we heard before with the demonstration. You don't get this for being a good person. This is your inheritance that you would love life, have the good life, and more than that, have a continued, deeper, richer relationship with God. Not just be a Christian and then continue to butt your head against the wall, but to actually grow in obedience. But I think we find this very, very hard to do. Before we look at this last question, how people will react, let's pause here for a second and talk about a pretty scary word. Obedience. Because if I said to you in any other context that your happiness and your joy will come in obedience, you would laugh at me. Because we associate that word obedience with negativity, don't we? With being a good pet. Here's a toy. We think of it as submission, compliance, slavery, obedience. I think this is what we often do. We think over here is my pleasure, my enjoyment, my good times. Yeah, we put that here. Over here is what God wants for my life. And usually that's not enjoyable. That's difficult. That's hard. It's another O word. Obligatory. I'm obliged to live these things. These two things are separate. My pleasure, my fun, my good times, and what God wants for my life. But we need to understand right now what God is saying to us. Look at it. The good life. The good life. Your life lived with the utmost pleasure and utmost delight and utmost joy is not separate from a life of obedience to God. It's found in obedience to God. They are not separate paths that interconnect from time to time. They are one path. Now, I understand how difficult this might seem because, again, God's calling upon our lives seems difficult. But that's why it's so beautiful. I know how hard this is in my own life. My wife, Sammy, she knows this only too well. She is the victim of the thing that I probably struggle with the most in my life, which is anger. And my anger is the most powerful indicator of my selfishness. It's a frequent and unwelcome guest in our home. And in the moment of my anger, I don't know if anyone else feels this, in the moment of my anger, I actually enjoy it. I enjoy the feeling of self-righteousness, the feeling of, of superiority, the feeling of winning an argument. But if you ask me one hour later, still feeling good? Is this the good life, you being a rage-filled knucklehead? Has the self-righteousness, has that led to satisfaction? I couldn't even look at you in the eyes. It doesn't bring me the good life, selfishness. The opposite. But imagine if in the place of my selfishness, my pleasure, I put God's direction, God's calling. I responded with love, with peace, with unity, with forgiveness. With compassion. Obedience to God is not a life of slavery. It's liberation from slavery to a life of joy 
is listening to the director, to the creator, to the maker, about what he says will actually work best. It's like actually reading the instructions on the Ikea thing you've just purchased and realising, oh, this does work when I do it this way. So, let's remember. Okay, what have we done? What have we done? Where do we find the good life? We find the good life on the cross of Christ. What does the good life look like? It looks like living in obedience to God. But now we come to a final question. What can we expect others to do in reaction to our living the good life? What's this going to look like? And what you read next might surprise you. Have a look at verse 13. Who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. You see, the truth is living a life of obedience to God puts you in direct odds with the world. Derision and mockery and physical attack, they will be additional parts of your inheritance. That will be yours if you live a life that obeys God. Do not correlate the good life with the easy life. And yet amazingly, amazingly here, even if you do suffer, you are still blessed. Why? How is that possible? Because your blessing has got nothing to do with other people's reactions to you. Your blessing is your new fan adoption as a child of God. Yours forever. No one can take that away from you. Your blessing is a deeper and richer relationship with God. Nothing anyone does can take that away from you. Your blessing is a life of goodness and love found in your relationship with God. So do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Verse 15, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Do not love the opinion of men. Love God. That's the key. Revere. What's that mean? Hold an esteem. Honor and glory. Love Christ more than you love the world. Love Christ more than you love yourself. I can think of a former boss of mine in the army. He was a Christian. I wasn't a Christian at the time. I thought he was a maniac. He came in and he stripped down all the pornographic posters that adorned the walls in our barracks. He banned drinking alcohol in work hours, which was a common practice. He banned strippers at work events, which was a common practice. What was his reward for this? Derision, mockery, hatred from above and below the chain of command. But you see, my friends, this is the core of the good life. Think about it. Salvation comes through Christ. Loving life comes through obedience to Christ. God and loving others. Do you see the connection? The good life has got nothing to do with you. It's all about living a life for Him. And from on there, it's not just about receiving blessing, but being a blessing. Verse 15 to 17 are some of the most remarkable words of Scripture. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Peter says here, in the face of attack, in the face of persecution, respond not just with putting up with it, but with evangelism. Why? Do it with gentleness and respect, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ might be ashamed of their slander. My friends, this is not so you make other people feel ashamed. This isn't about having a Facebook war with an atheist. Go, oh, I've just won an argument point. Peter is calling us to respond in such a way to persecution that others may see your actions and love God so that you can be the ultimate blessing to someone else. Show others the love of Christ. Do you see? By standing firm, by telling them of what Jesus has done. That's why you stand firm. That's why you do what you do. That's why you don't seek revenge like others do. That's why you love like you love. That's why you forgive like you forgive because of what Christ has done for you. My friends, you cannot have one without the other. The good life and God, they can't be separated. They are the one. And I thought to end this sermon very quickly, I might give you an example of someone, a great figure from history, who could sort of exemplify all of these character traits. And then it struck me. Peter's actually done that for us already. Look at verse 18 again. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. 
And then you look over what Peter's told us. Be united, be compassionate, be humble, love one another. Don't repay evil with evil, but evil with blessing. Turn from wrongdoing, do good, seek peace, pursue it, love life, enjoy life. When you realise what you're reading, it becomes crystal clear that Peter is not making this up. Peter is describing Jesus. If you want to live the good life, live and love like Jesus. He is the model. He is the picture. Live like Jesus. Love like Jesus. Forgive like Jesus. Obey like Jesus. This is the core and the key of living your life the way you were designed to live. Who in your life needs forgiveness right now? Who in your life do you need to love more right now? Who in your life, in this very auditorium, can you look at and know, I need to be united with that person. I need to apologize with that person. I need to be reconciled with that person. What area of your life do you need to obey God that he's calling upon you, that you know you're rejecting, but actually you need to obey? My friends, don't do it to get a sticker. Do it because you love God and you want to live like Jesus. And if today you've realized that you don't love Jesus at all, you've, you've seen now the picture of what Jesus has done on the cross and thought, man, I need to get right with God. I want to live like this. Then the greatest news of all is that you don't earn this gift. It's yours as a gift. It's your inheritance if you were taken. Do not delay. Call out upon God's name today. He promises that you will be saved. And don't keep it to yourself. I'll be up the front after church or speak to the person who brought you. Friends, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Our Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that Jesus, the righteous and perfect man, became unrighteous so that we may know you. I pray for your Spirit's work upon the hearts of your people here today. That you would convict us of where we need to obey you, but also that you'd just be calling men and women home to you. The men and women sitting here today who've realized they're not right with you, but they want to be. Lord, I pray you'd give them the courage to actually take that step and put their faith in you and your son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.